I'm very, very happy to continue our colloquium series. This is our second month. We're going to plan to do this every month for the rest of the academic year. And this month, I'm happy to have with us Dr. Fred Martin, who has been at the Media Lab for over 15 years. And oh, the Media Lab's only that old. Oh, well. 13 years. We ran off in the nearest five. The, uh, he's done some really cool work uh, with a programming language called Logo, which is a lot like a programming language that you spent a month studying and doing it from the design side and from the educational point of view. So he's going to talk about his work with us today, and I'd like to please welcome Dr. Fred Martin. Thank you. So I'll start out by saying a little bit more about my background. And But first I want to say I'm really excited to be here and meet you guys. Um, I'm very interested in alternative learning environments. That's been really the theme of my work for the last 15 years. Um, and I think it's really exciting what you guys are doing. And I guess you're the first class, so you're all guinea pigs. And it looks like it's a lot of fun, so I'm a little jealous. <laughs> Um, I've just left MIT, like as of this fall, for the first time in my life, essentially, since I started there when I was 16 years old as an undergrad. So and I'm 36 now, so it's 20 years at MIT. So it's kind of fun to be to be away, but at the same time, I have to, I have to figure out what's new, um, what what in terms of what I'm going to be working on. But I, I do plan to continue work in education and technology, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I guess the main the main theme of what I'm, what I'm going to be showing you guys is this sort of I'm going to start out with some history going back to as as some um, shy was saying that the scheme is the language you guys used is that right mm -hmm. That's, um, and I'm going to start out talking about logo which is a, a language that was came out of the MIT AI lab the same place where scheme came from and was made as a language for kids. Um, and that's led to a bunch of projects in um, hardware um, in collaboration with the Lego company. And the, the Mindstorms that's on the slide title is this new product. Well, it's two years old now. How many of you guys have played with this thing? A, only one. you got, you got to get hardware in. We were just, Sly and I were talking. Right, we we, we, we got to buy a bunch of You can just talk to Mike Allen. Okay. Um, He's right there. Where, where, Mike, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm going to basically talk about this is a, a product of the Lego company. It's, um, it's a computer brick that you can plug motors and sensors into, and then you use software on your PC to compose a program that gets downloaded into this block, and then your model can run away with, with the carrying its own brain. Um, and this is two-year-old product of the Lego company, and basically what I'm going to do is, is describe the whole sort of span of work that led to this. Um, yeah, so I, I have my alumni address. That's the best way to reach me. I still have basically my work is on my MIT web pages, so that's the address. And you guys got that by email. Um, this is this is an overview of a longer talk, so I'm not going to get to everything in in what's on the slide here. But I, I want to, this is fun. This part, brief history of cybernetic thinking. Um, you know, cybernetics was this term that really came in vogue in, in the 1940s and 50s as a result of a lot of the work that was done around making weapons for World War II, automatic control systems to guide missiles. Um, um, but the ideas are, go way back. And, and when I was doing some research, some library research for my doctoral dissertation where I was sort of explaining cybernetics over the years, um, I found this great history that Basically, the first upper half of this slide came from this one book by Otto Meyer. And the first recorded history of the... So the idea of cybernetics, a control system, something that measures the state of a system and feeds that back to control the state. So, you know, a thermostat is your classic example in everyday life. Where did that idea first exist? In, in human history, and it was in China with this water clock. And... Uh, the way the water, so you want to measure time, and this idea, and these are things things were actually built. The way you measure time is you have this vat of water, um, and if you can maintain the water level at a constant level, then it creates a constant pressure on the, the opening at the basin, and that will create a constant amount of flow, and then you just measure the flow, and there's your clock. Because how do you keep the water level constant? And basically, they built the float valve, so that you've got this thing that's sitting on top of the water, and when the uh, you know, water level goes down, it lets more water in. 
So where do you find this in your house? <laughs> so what was once a water clock is now a toilet. <laughs> So we could sell time without it. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, you could do a little engineering. And, um, in, in, this, in this history that I found, basically this idea of control systems didn't reemerge in Western culture anyway until, and I mean, I think it was lost in Eastern culture as well, uh, until the mid-1600s when this guy Hubble, um, who is a scientist and entrepreneur, was trying to basically provide poultry for the French royalty. And he invented the first like functional chicken hatcheries um, using the same idea of measuring the temperature and, and controlling, you know, keeping it constant by controlling the heat source. Um, and the next big breakthrough was in the 1700s, the steam engine governor. Oh, I don't have a picture of that here. Um, and that was, you know, this is a famous invention that really precipitated the Industrial Revolution. These steam engines were big, you know, monstrosities, and they basically, when the boiler would would get stoked up, then the power output would just take off, and the thing basically was like a monster out of control. And so James Watt put together a bunch of ideas. It's it's interesting if you read the history because you know it's a famous name, and at least as as it seems from what I've read. Um, he doesn't take credit for having done anything new, even though he's credited with that. He basically said, oh, I put a bunch of ideas together. But, of course, that's what you know, good invention really is. Um, so he, he built this, this apparatus that you put in the output shaft with these, um, basically these heavy metal balls that, as the shaft went, spun faster, they'd get pushed outward. And that, with, with a, a sort of contraption of levers, that would throttle down um, the steam engine so you'd have constant power. And that was really critical for the stuff actually being useful. Um, in the 1800s, the, sort of the way these, these ideas got transformed is there's this big interest in mechanical automata, basically contraptions like, and a lot of these were fake. There was like things like this mechanical chess player where there'd be some complicated mechanical robot that supposedly played chess, and, but actually there was a little, like basically a, a, a midget inside of it who was playing chess. Um, but there were a lot of authentic, very sophisticated contraptions that were just meant to... Um, sort of stimulate the imagination and basically the precursors of AI, building machines that represented intelligence. Um, so there's a contemporary place that the next time anyone is in London, I highly recommend. It's called the Cabaret Mechanical. I actually met the people who run the place. It's a family-run museum. Um, it's small, but they have this wonderful collection of some old and some new like contraptions. And they're, you know, they're all really kind of whimsical, and a lot of them are like sort of wicked political or, you know, satire sort of comments. So it's sort of more, ad I mean, there's not like sexual stuff, but there's funny, it's, it's more appreciated by adults than by kids, some of them. But anyway, like this one I like is because it's the recursion theme, you know, the guy on the left. There's a lot of like husband and wife sort of things. I don't know what that one on the right does, but you turn the crank and there's this complicated series of cams that makes this whole little thing play its show. So the Capri Theater. Um, so anyway, if you go to London, look it up. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go over this part really quickly. Um, but, you know, I mentioned the, the cybernetics, and Norbert Weiner was one of the leaders, one of the people who came up with that term. Um, and a lot of it was driven by World War II and the need to make better weapons and, and stuff that was more accurate. Um, what happened in the 50s, and this is just a very you know, brief and biased thing, but, but what's personally inspiring to me is the work of W. Gray Walter, who was um, a British neuroscientist who basically was also a hacker. And um, he built these vacuum tube controlled robots. And I'd say, as far as I can tell, he's the first guy to build autonomous robots and treat them like pets. You know, and now of like, this year's like most popular Christmas toy is going to be the Poochie robot dog, which was really based on um, the work of this Sony scientist who built these robotic dogs that were really sophisticated just a couple years back. Um, but anyway, this guy, Gray Walter, he wrote up these articles that were as if he had discovered a new life form and he gave them some Latin name for you know, each of his robots and like described its behaviors in this. And they're very clever designs in, in sort of in a lot of ways. I mean, he would get one or two vacuum tubes to make the thing have ten different behaviors that overlap in different ways. So it was very clever. 
Um, but the real, the sort of, the, the real special part to me is that he thought of them as being little creatures. And when I see kids building these Lego models, it's so prevalent. It's basically you can't help yourself. But and especially when you've built it yourself and it has some, you know, weird kind of interaction with a sensor or it just does something funny and you're not exactly sure why, you know, and you just sort of try, you, 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 it's hard to not attribute some kind of personality to it. Certainly, actually, Mike and I, who have both done work on the MIT 6070 contest, um, it's very interesting because there's this particular problem that the students are presented with that, that you have to solve in order to, to win or to succeed. But the machines that people build are also different, and you can really see a correlation between the personality of the students and the behavior of the robot. And you get these students who are, well, I don't want to, actually, I'm not even being recorded. I was going to make I was going to make a fraternity joke, but I'll. Um, well, that's enough. Anyway, you know, and then those are tend to be the violets, the the, the robots that are a little bit more violent or aggressive, and you know, I mean, it's a lot of it can be stereotypical, but but anyway, there's this just real personality that comes out when people build these sort of things. So, um, Gray Walter's stuff was a direct inspiration to um, my own mentor, um, <coughs> Seymour Papert. And Seymour, um, Seymour is, is a professor at MIT. He started at MIT in the, in the 1960s. He was co-director of the uh, Artificial Intelligence Lab with Marvin Minsky, probably 10 years' time, um, and, has, has, and is also a founder of the Media Lab in, in 1985. So Seymour's been doing work for a long time. Um, and he studied with Jean Piaget, um, and, and that's a famous name if you study um, cognitive science or child psychology. He's credited as being the first cognitive psych psychologist, probably before that term was invented, um, who took what kids said seriously. He didn't think of kids as miniature adults, and when kids had sort of some way of describing something in the world, um, he actually took literally what they said, that that really represented what they thought and that there were these misconceptions or alternate ways of looking at the world that kids have. Um, he had a theory of phases that you go through. That a classic experiment of Piaget's was this idea of um, conservation, that basically, I, I think this is still true, if you take, um, take a, a fixed amount of water and pour it into a tall, thin glass versus something more like a narrow, uh, a wide dish that, that the water will only be kind of flat, kids will think there's more water in the tall glass, up to a certain point where kids realize that no water is this substance that doesn't change in quantity when you move it from vessel to vessel. So what Piaget found was that basically everyone goes through this period of being pre-conservation where you don't realize that the amount of stuff, you think that the amount of stuff changes when it's moved around, um, to post-conservation when uh, you realize that no, it's the same amount of stuff. Roughly what age does that happen? Well, that's something that's been argued up and down, and I shall, I'll re respond with an anecdote. Um, I don't know if, if any of you might know uh, Margaret Minsky, who's Marvin Minsky's daughter. Um, she, there's a story about her. It's, it's all a very small community, especially when you're still in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> that, you know, because Seymour and, and Marvin were doing this work at when she was a young girl, and so, you know, somebody was trying to do the conservation experiment with Margaret. And she was like, you know, this is conservation. We did this last week. <laughs> um, but a, a, a lot of the work post Piaget has been people, you know, redoing the experiments, seeing that kids much younger than Piaget thought actually have this idea of conservation. And you know, some people don't necessarily believe that this series, uh, sort of series of sequ sequential stages is actually true. Um, and so there's been a lot of, you know. He sort of laid the foundation for this whole way of thinking, but a lot of his particular theories have been challenged. Um, so Seymour studied with Piaget in his lab in Geneva, and I guess that would be the 40s and 50s. Seymour also has a, a doctorate in mathematics. Um, I think he has more than one doctorate. Um, but basically, I think the work with Piaget, and I'm sure he was predisposed to want to work with children, he's dedicated most of his life to creating um, new materials to enrich ch children's world, and he's the, the world of children, and he's really specifically interested in the way technologies changes the way we think. Um, so Seymour is one of the inventors. 
Well, actually, let me just finish what's on the slide. Um, so, yeah, Piaget ha has his theories of learning were called constructivism with a V. And by that he meant that this process of, of gaining knowledge is something of constructing ideas and it's very active by the learner. So that's sort of in opposition to conventional ways of schooling where, I mean, if you look at, you know, the model of learning that would be promulgated by the MCAS, you know, test, it's basically there's a collection of facts, you have to memorize them, we're going to hand them off to you and, you know, it, you know, that's sort of, to be pejorative, it's the idea of pouring information into the kid's head. Um, and I think Piaget's idea of constructivism is that it's very active and you don't necessarily, you're not even aware of the ways in which children are assimilating and, and creating their knowledge. Um, but what Seymour adds to this, and he calls constructionism with an N, is the idea of students building real things and that you're building this computer program or a robot or a poem or a song, whatever, um, but by the act of making something, that, that thing that you're making reflects back to your understandings, your ways of thinking. It also serves as a social artifact where people around you, your community, people can give you feedback on your ideas. Um, so Seymour is basically saying, let's do education by having people make stuff. It's a pretty simple idea, um, and I think pretty common sense. <coughs> so, okay, I'm going to go right to this slide. Yeah. So this kind of is, this slide is sort of an overview of the technology that's been spawned by Seymour directly and then people who work with him. Um, so... I mentioned at the beginning the logo programming language, which was the work was done at the AI lab. Seymour used to have offices there. Um, and it was really um, as a result of Seymour seeing the way that the grad students and the other faculty at the AI lab were, st were studying cognition by writing computer programs, by writing scheme code. People writing code as a way of reflecting on how the human mind works. And I don't, you know, I don't know why, but basically he said, kids should be doing this. Um, and I, I wrote in my abstract um, that back at the time, the idea of a kid operating computer was, you know, just absurd. I mean, okay, so I was, you know, I was less than five in the 1960s, but by an image of what computers were like is it was still the punch card era. I guess at the AI lab, things like, um, you know, shared... Um, re like, I'm forgetting the acronym, but uh, time-sharing operating systems. You could tell me. What, what were some of the... Older. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's why you should know. Like, some of the first, like, you know, you had one computer, and basically you wanted to have a lot of people using it at once, so they wrote the first... Op time-sharing. Yeah, time-sharing. Popular in the 70s. But there, some of the work was done in, like, the 60s, right? Um, Tops yeah. 20, was that? That's a deck Tops, one. Tops 20 was... I guess, okay, I'm going off on a tangent. The, probably the popular image of computers at the time was the big machines locked in a room with punch cards. The practical reality at places like the AI lab and other university research labs would be there'd be interactive consoles where people are actually talking to the machine in real time. So that sort of was the beginnings of that. Um, and that really, that sort of idea of how you interact with the computer, the listener and scheme, you're, you're typing to it, it's doing stuff. You know, it's got a state that you're interacting with. It's running code while you're talking to it. Um, that whole way of thinking about computers started in the 60s at places like the AI lab. And that really inspired Seymour's work on Logo, which is very much like Scheme. It's basically um, Scheme without the parentheses. <laughs> um, and it's... You know, the, instead of being the operator followed by the arguments, you can, it's more functional where you could say the, the name of the function you want to call followed by its arguments. So it's a little bit more like we're used to thinking in that regard. Um, but the killer app, so they built this, this logo and they had kids typing at mainframes. They first started doing stuff like, like computer poetry where you'd have you know, a list of nouns and a list of verbs and the computer would randomly pick one and sling it together and you know, the computer would generate nonsense poems. Um, things like that. List processing, which is a big part of Scheme, was a big part of Logo. Um, the killer app for Logo was the turtle. Um, actually, this is going to go to the wrong place. 
And the turtle was first basically one of um, Gray Walter's robots that was controlled by the mainframe, controlled by Logo. So it was, you know, like an inverted trash can that was motorized and had a, a cable tether back to the mainframe, and kids could type stuff like um, forward 20, right 90, and then the thing would go forward 20 units, and right 90 was 90 degrees. And so they could drive it around. And then someone got the idea of sticking a pen in it and putting butcher paper on the floor. And then kids could make drawings. So that was like the killer app for Logo. When, when got the turtle, that's, you know, that's what really made it take off. And now if you ask people who have heard of Logo, particularly in, school, in the school world, you know, what, what, if you say Logo, they say turtle. So it sort of becomes synonymous, which in a way is a bad thing because most of what ended up happening when Logo reached schools was the computer science side got lost and it just became the scripting language for driving the turtle around. Um, and those of, how many people actually used Logo when they were kids? Oh, still, see. See, 10 years from now, it's probably not going to be true. Um, so most people know what the turtle is. Um, <laughs> What was that? I just said they probably still will have used uh, Logo as kids in 10 years' time. Hopefully. Oh, these, oh you guys will have, yeah. I don't know. Um, all right. What, what this link is... Um, this, this... Yeah. So uh, what I was going to... This There's a series of slides here. What this is pointing at is um, back when Logo was... Uh, the turtle was making the transition from being this you know, trash can robot to being the thing on the screen. Seymour and one of his collaborators at the time, Cynthia Solomon, um, were thinking about, well, the computer isn't, logo isn't just about controlling turtles. It could be about controlling anything. So they, they wrote this, this paper, 20 things to do with the computer, um, and a lot of them were just like basically screen type of applications, although then it, it was, this was pre-screen because this was in like 70, 1970. So, you know, it was the computer poetry and list processing and things like that. But like at least half of the things in this paper were imagining logo hooked up to physical stuff other than the turtle and, and imagining like an environment where kids could build the machinery that, that's part of the system. So Seymour, he, he, like, he still does this uh, exercise where, you, and this, these, are, these are images scanned out of the paper. Um, you know, try to balance a broomstick versus a toothbrush, and it turns out most people can balance the broomstick, but nobody can balance the toothbrush. And then you get into a discussion, why do you think that? And people who have taken physics will have a very mathematical explanation why that's true, but... You know, just sort of about anybody can say something about. First, you could just notice that it's true, and then you could think about why. So Seymour likes to do these exercises where people's different way of thinking becomes an object for discussion. But then you can go further. You don't have to just talk about it. You can actually sort of build a thing and then write a program to try to simulate it. So you could say, all right, let's build this truck, and we've got uh, the hinge with one degree of freedom, so it's not the two degrees of freedom when it's bouncing on your hand. And then instead of just like sticks of different length, you could have one stick with a, a mass on it that you can move up and down. And basically you convince yourself that this is pretty much the same problem. And that, you know, that's not too hard. And then you could build it and actually play with it and say, yeah, it, it's the same problem. But then you can, uh, well, basically you stick that thing on a turtle. I guess that's what that <laughs> is. And, and then, the, and then you write a logo program to try to keep it stable. So you have to put a, um, a sensor, a p potentiometer in the hinge. So you, you put a sensor to measure uh, the, the angle of, of the rod, and you can make it go forward or backward. And you, and you try, so these are, this was sort of a thought experiment. I don't know if at the particular time when this was written, any of Seymour's students actually tried to build this very thing. But there's a, a collection of things like this. Um, so really, back in 1970, uh, Seymour's thinking, you know, this logo's more than just printing stuff on the page. We've got to make it control things. Um, so the screen turtles, uh, the people, most of you have seen logo. I'll, I'll just, I have to show it. Uh, here's like a contemporary version of logo. And there's the turtle. 
the first turtles were like done on like vector screens, so they were triangles, and you could never tell where the point was. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. So I could say forward 50. Oh, and so now it's moving. Oh, I don't know if people can see. Let me make that a little bit bigger. No, pen's not down. So we say pen down. Now let's try forward 50. Yeah, all right, 90. So I can say, whoops. Now the thing was, you'd say, you know, you'd ask kids maybe, can you draw a square? And, you know, they'd keep the forward 50 and write 90. And ultimately, they might realize that you could use this repeat command to draw a square. Um, and what, what happens when it, it enters school is we were really trying that logo would be this, in, you know, be this environment for exploration and, and kids coming up with their own ideas and make their own projects. But teachers would just be teaching repeat four, forward, whatever, right, 90 makes a square. You know, it would just be that that was sort of the ultimate downfall of logo is it just got assimilated into the schoolish ways of thinking and became another stupid thing. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the, you know, and you could say, how do you make a circle? There was, there was a lot of work done. Um, Brian Harvey was one of Seymour's collaborators at the time, and he, he wrote like a three-volume set, computer science logo style, where, you know, you get into mathematics, and well, there's another book called Turtle Geometry with um, Andy DeSessa. You can actually, like, take a serious crack at the, the sort of set of ideas in Cartesian geometry from logo point of view rather than from... Um, you know, the Euclidean point of view or the coordinate geometry um, point of view. So there's like a lot of math developed and anyway, it's a pretty rich world. Um, you could define procedures and stuff like that. Right. Well, logo could only draw straight lines. So how do you make a circle? You know? The length of line goes to zero. Yeah. Yeah, somebody said as the length of the line goes to zero, you, you know, approach the true definition of circle. You get something that looks like a circle before you actually hit zero. Um, there was this idea that, that was talked about at the time, the total turtle trip theorem, which is that <laughs> once the turtle has rotated 360 degrees, then it's come back you know, to the rotation where it started. And basically, that, you know, that will make a circle if, if you multiply the amount of times it's repeating by the amount it's repeating each time. You get to 360, then you're going you're gonna to close the loop. You know. Yeah, so we'll do repeat 10 times, forward 5, right 36. Oh, well, it's a little bit too small. Uh, let's just make it repeat. You know, then you have to think, well, if I want the, the circle to be a certain size, how big does the forward have to be? I'm just going to make it big enough so you can see it. Yeah. Well, that's not exactly a circle, but, you know, you can get, repeat 20 times forward. Well, we're, we're trying to use integers here. Yeah, so. That's pretty much a circle. Um, but there was a lot of thinking about geometry, you know, how how to get things to, to, to line up and, you know, kids would make drawings or they try to make a house or, you know, you'd make procedures and it's funny to see what happened because in one of the earlier versions of Logo, before the mouse, okay, so this is mid-80s, um, there was a, a, a escape key that you could then move the turtle around with the four arrow keys. It was, called, it was the function nine. So there, there were these big discussions about whether or not function nine should be allowed. Because then kids could not have to think about the angles and, and distances. They could just put the turtle wherever they want. And a lot of teachers were really, you know, upset that, that the, you know, the software had this new function that made their lives a lot more difficult because then kids wouldn't be forced to drive the turtle around. They could just pick it up and move it where they wanted. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a big deal at the time. And, you know, now that's, it's, even to get the kids to do this at all would be seen as, you know, bizarre because just draw the square with, you know, the, the mouse. Um, so the challenge really is to say what's the computational power here? What sort of things can, can you describe 
um, mathematically and, and algorithmically that let you make drawings that really wouldn't be possible if you're just drawing f with the mouse. You know, so if you made, you know, for fractals would be a, an, an example that, that, you know, for higher math. <coughs> but even just repeating a tree in five different places, if you define once a procedure to make a tree, then you could tell the turtle draw a tree here, draw it here, draw it here. So. And th this actually, this software lets you do animations where you can make the turtle change what it looks like. There's this whole set of, uh, you know, shapes that the turtle can be. So we can make the turtle be a bumblebee. <laughs> and then with logo commands, you can make it be that bumblebee or this one. And then, you know, you can make it flap its wings and fly around. <laughs> so it actually, it's a pretty nice environment for scripting, sort of dynamic things. It's great for making simple video games. So there's a lot of stuff where you can still motivate the, the sort of programming underneath. Um, and that's a lot of how this is actually still used in schools. Um, all right. What grade level is this used? Mostly the uh, elementary school, upper elementary. Yeah, I mean... But a lot of the products nowadays are what you say. They're front ends to the real world, though, right? They just, they, um, they just give you a, a, a higher level scripting language on top of Logo and much of Like there's something called Logo Writer or something. Oh, like, yeah. Like that. Well, Jeez. right. Logo, Logo Writer was one of the pretty early ones. This one's called Micro Worlds, made by the same company that did Logo Writer. Mm -hmm. um, but that there's Logo underneath. I mean, this even has the conventional paint tools. So, you know, if you just wanted to draw the square... You know, you, you could do it like this, but so, <laughs> but right. But there's this whole exploration of geometry and, and math, and then ultimately, if in the hands of of kids who are just motivated or teachers that are creative, you can start to think about types of things that you can create with programming underneath that you couldn't create just by drawing it with the mouse. It's the little icon of the kid doing this. <laughs> That's the undo. <laughs> It actually has a sound effect attached to it. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that was. I think this did come after Kid Picks. Those of you who remember Kid Picks, it was like a drawing program where the goal for kids, where the goal of just doing stuff was sort of the activity. It had all these sound effects and. You know, it was really well done. It was really early Mac. You know, it was like a Mac SE days. They still use it. Yeah, yeah it's still fun. What's your company? When I first like brought a Mac to my mom, that was like the first thing I had her do. You know, because you can't do anything wrong. It's just you know, it's then making a final drawing isn't the goal really. It's just to have fun doing stuff. Um. All right, I'll go back to the presentation notes. We're running out of time to actually get to the Lego side of things. Um, so, yeah, so the sort of software-based logos are, are, are on the left side. The thing I was just showing you is Microworld's logo. Um, Mitch Resnick, who I work with for a long time at the Media Lab um, and is faculty there, um, he, he, for his PhD thesis, he created a thing called Star Logo, which is a, a massively parallel version of Logo with hundreds of turtles and um, and for really you know exploring emergent phenomena and um, actually some of, one of his students right right now one of his PhD students has been doing a lot of work with teachers at high school level using star logo and um, basically developing a curriculum around studying emergence with high school kids writing these star logo programs so that's pretty cool um, that was originally done on the connection machine um, like, gee, I guess probably people might not know what that is. Yeah, that was like this um, computer with 16,000 processors in it. Oh yeah, yeah. For a long time, the I think the Media Lab had one of the disk arrays, which has this really elegant, uh, you know, design. It's big, and basically now it serves as a bar. And, um, so then, then it was ported to the Mac, and now it's in, available in Java. So it's it's a nice it's a nice environment. If you go to the Media Lab and search for Star Logo, it's 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 cool software. Um, all right. So then there's this other big branch that happened in the mid '80s, which is the work of connecting Logo to Lego, um, to physical stuff. And the the real breakthrough is actually the idea of using the Lego materials. Um, sometime in the Probably as late 70s, Lego created this uh, system that's now known by the brand name Lego Technic, which is 
I don't really have many good instances of it here. But um, it's basically this... Uh, he has nothing much to say. This is a little robot. But um, it's this really nice mechanical building environment with Lego where you have uh, beams and axles. And Mike, do you have any of it here? Not that I'm going to make you leave the talk and go get it. You, all right, you're going to bring some in. Um, in addition to the puzzles and stuff, we can have like a kit of Lego to play with. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's this great, it's this great building system, basically. And if there, if there is one core expertise of the Lego company, it's making great plastic and you know great building materials. You know now they're branched off in all these things, and it's a real sort of challenge for them to become you know brilliant at these other things like they have been at plastic. Um, so some researchers at Seymour's lab. Um, Mitchell Resnick, who I just mentioned with Star Logo, and actually a man named Steve Ako, who just passed away um, last month, was a you know, big part of, of this work. Um, and Brian Silverman, who is the, who is the chief scientist at LCSI that produced Michael World's logo. Um, the, basically, those three people and Seymour created this interface between the logo language and the Lego product. And it, it resulted in a collaboration with the Lego company um, that that's continues to this day. They're a big sponsor of, of Mitchell's group at the Media Lab um, that led to this series of products. The first product was something that was we called Lego Logo, uh, Lego slash Logo, because you know, the names were even a match. Um, Lego launched it by the product name Lego TC Logo, and they lowercase the L in Logo. So a lot of us were annoyed with that. <laughs> but everybody just called it Lego Logo anyway. Um, and that was, so that, this is back in the Apple II IBM PC era. And it was um, this black interface box that plugged into a slot card in, in the machine. And there was a very simple text-based logo. Um, and then kids could build models and plug. It supported two motors and three motors and two sensors. So kids could build these these models and write logo programs is basically just like that, that slide I was showing you with the guy trying to balance the stick. Kids could actually do this. Um, so that's been around for about 15 years. Um, I joined Seymour's group just when basically the first commercial product of that was done and launched to schools. And what we were looking to do is, um, this is basically Seymour's idea, let's take the computer, which is the Apple II, and take this interface box, which is you know about like twice the size of a VHS cassette, and let's make it into something we could hold in our hands and, and kids could build into a model. Um, so that was sort of the work that I started doing uh, in, it was like 1987 when I joined Seymour's group. Um, so we had this series of, of things, this series of programmable bricks. This is actually a, a picture of a more recent one. This is one that was done in 1994. Um, and I did a, a bunch of work with kids and teachers, sort of, we created this prototype, made like a hundred of these, brought them into schools. Um, so I'd like to actually show a video of some of the classroom work that I did. And so let's see if I can... Oh. Hey, it's working. Oops. No. Um, this is footage from a, a fourth grade classroom. Um, we did a workshop with a group of teachers, and um, and so the teachers had this experience of building these Lego models and, and writing logo to to control their model. And then we started to think, well, what are we going to do in in the, the classrooms? What what kind of activity should the teachers do with their kids. It's not just going to be about building Lego. It has to be something that has a larger context. So the teachers came up with this idea of building robotic animals. Um, and, and partly that was we wanted to make sure that it was an activity that would be inviting to girls as well as boys. Um, the activity I'd done with the teachers was a robot design contest, sort of modeled after the 6270 contest at MIT. And they had a great time, but they thought, for our kids, we don't want it to be competition, and we want something that, that girls and, and boys will both like equally well. So this has turned out to be a great theme. Um, this is the first... I I'll, I'll, I'll do a little interview here. So.
to to the sensor on its head. Uh huh. Oh, so because he's scared of the light? Yeah, because This is the first time they got it like turning and the touch sensor working. with two different teachers in this school um, and th this teacher John Bellotta actually shortly after um, I was doing this stuff with him in his classroom he ended up moving out of the classroom and taking sort of a technology um, district coordinator role in his in his school system because he really believes in you know this sort of activity and wanted to help other teachers uh, you know get it going in their classrooms uh, now this this group of teachers that I work with it's still going this is like this is more than six years old. This tape, and um, there's st there's like an annual like robot show. Um, I guess it's like the, it's called Robotic Park. That's and so there's a lot of teachers in. It's in the state of Rhode Island. It's like a two hour drive from here. Um, but it's really nice to see things take root in a classroom. And what I you know what I've found in in working with schools for you know like 10, 15 years now is. Bottom up works much better than top down for really making you know, making things change. That when you get teachers who are really motivated, they want to try something new, um, and then teachers teaching each other is the best way to actually get new ideas in, into classrooms. Like you know, I I can go and say, hey, this is a really great activity. Let's do a week long workshop and you know and lead a really good activity for teachers. But in order to say, how is this going to work in a you know, regular classroom where the kids are there every day, um, you know, classroom management issues, all that stuff is teachers working with each other is just the best way, in, you know, in my experience. Um, so this stuff has really taken root in, in this group of schools in Rhode Island. Um, does this work the same way my does? You hook it up to the computer, the room is computer. Yeah. Cool. This is the last little snippet. Um, it's exact, It's really exactly the same at a conceptual level, and I think this work is what led Lego as a as a sort of company to come to the decision that yeah, this this programmable brick stuff really is for real. Um, this is actually an interesting collaboration. This group of three girls was the project team, but when they wanted to build that dinosaur head. There was this boy in the classroom who was known as, in the classroom as this great artist. So they basically had the, the boy do the, you know, the body for their robot. So it sort of, you know, breaks some of the gender stereotypes. <laughs> and plus, they had the only, like, sort of, you would call violent project. <laughs> Because that, um, sorry, there's no stop button. I guess I'll hit play again. No, that doesn't do it. Yeah, stop button on that thick Commodore either. <laughs> All right, well, just forget it. Um, that, that dinosaur was only half of their project. This, is, this was done just when the movie The First Jurassic Park was out. And that, you know, that was like the theme, the robotic park of animals and stuff. So they, the other part of the project was the Jeep carrying a flashlight. And the dinosaur, like, hunt down that Jeep and, you know, knocked it over. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, you know, I designed this prototype and, and, and we used it in like six classrooms at the time. And, and this really did lay the groundwork for Lego to say, wow, this stuff really works. This previous prototypes have been really flaky and basically if me or one of the other people in, in the group left the classroom, it would immediately stop working. And, you know, it was just wasn't robust, so teachers couldn't use it on their own. And like the hardware that we gave to the school was like it, last, it was only like last year where they returned it to me because the Lego product was out. 
Uh, yeah, so here's like a publicity shot of the Lego programmable brick, which you can see is very related to the red MIT programmable brick. Um, they came up with an acronym that basically there's no other things in the world called RCXs. It doesn't actually stand for anything, <laughs> but it's unique. <laughs> The, the way that it's marketed um, is it's marketed as part of this thing called the robotics invention system. And it's this, uh, you can buy in the toy store. Now, this, this was a breakthrough that, because a lot of the work inside the Lego company was done in the education division, because previously their stuff had only been, the computerized stuff had only been sold to schools. And basically there was a new vice president inside of Lego who saw this thing, and th this guy also is very energetic, and he also came from outside the company, whereas often they would promote from within. So he's a free thinker. And he saw this stuff and said, this isn't just for schools, this is like the next big toy. And you know, for the last two Christmases, it was a big toy. Um, so you get this package with that brick, you get the software, you get, there's an infrared communications uh, device that plugs in the serial line. Um, you get two motors, you get two touch sensors, you get a light sensor, and then 700 additional Lego pieces for building all sorts of stuff. And it's $200. What's the memory in this brick? Size? It's got 28K of static RAM. It's got a, a basically an 8-bit processor with um, you know some 16-bit math instructions. It, yeah, it's sort of low-tech in a way. Um, but it's you know it's perfect for what it's intended to do, which is to build these little control programs for Lego models. Um, well, you could easily write a program that has a hit a wall, back up, look for. Okay. Uh oh, I see. Uh, there's enough room to have it write programs to have it do reasonable things on a living room floor. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there's the, there's this huge like hobbyist community that sprung up like immediately around this thing. People reversed it. I mean, it was incredibly fast. How how it was it was incredible how fast this thing was fully reverse engineered, published on the web, and it really took Lego by surprise. They thought they'd have at least six months, you know, <laughs> and it was almost like the day it was out. And I, I think there was some information leaked, not by me. Um, that, that, I, don't, I was very careful, but You're some people, <laughs> some people did leak information. And I know who they are. <laughs> um, they weren't, they weren't MIT. Yeah. Sorry, how much does it weigh? Also, do you put batteries that will run your Lego creations? Does it run off the same? Yeah. Why don't you repeat the question? Okay. The question was, how much does it weigh, and do you put the batteries that run it inside the the device? Um, I'll pass this one around. It's pretty light when there's no batteries in it, but it takes six AA cells because motors draw a lot of power, and basically you need a lot of battery to run the motors. Um, so then it becomes heavy, and it actually is a bit of an issue for a, a fledgling Lego designer to build something that carries this and doesn't fall apart is not trivial. Um, I should have the batteries in it to give you the full sense of what it weighs, but it's nice and light when there's no batteries in there. Um, yeah, so it is fully autonomous. The things run around on their own, sort of just like you know the video showed that the MIT prototype, and that one also had the batteries built in. Are there light sensors on it? You can plug a light sensor in. Um, all right, I'm just going to kind of finish off with where the work that was going at the Media Lab since that came out, the RCX brick. Um, and what we started to work on after the RCX was sort of launched was we, was something that we're we now call the cricket. And this is like, you know, there's a question about how much RAM does that have and how fast is it and this. The cricket is like one-tenth of all those specs. It's run on this chip called a, a PIC processor, which is... Um, basically the processor that goes inside of a mouse. So it's like pretty simple. Um, the Cricut can only do a couple motors and a couple sensors. Um, but we built the sort of a software environment that's in the same spirit as Logo so that you can talk to your Cricut what, you know, from the, the keyboard as if, you know, as if you're talking to the Logo Turtle. Um, so let me, let's see. See if I have another slide that shows anything nice. Oh, yeah. Th this is um, 
This is a project built with the Cricut. Um, this is actually done at Wellesley College. Uh, there's a couple of faculty there that we've been working with. Uh, one of them is a C CS professor who's an, uh, an MIT grad, Franklin Turback, and then Robbie Berg, who's a, a physics professor. And Robbie really, he, he came and did a sabbatical at MIT and saw the, the robot design contest at MIT and said, wow, this is really great. I want to do this kind of stuff with my students. but sort of similar to the elementary school teachers. You didn't want to do a contest. So he came up with this idea of doing a, an art studio um, where basically it's very open-ended. Um, students have one month to build these models and program, get to do something. You can build anything you like, but you're going to show it off at a gallery opening at the end of the, the month. Um, and there's you know, wine and cheese served. Um, so it, there's, there's a whole great range of things. And a lot of them are really interactive, like you don't just sort of watch it, but you know you do something with it, and it does something back. Sort of a lot like the cabaret mechanical things, where you turn the crank and something happens. Um, so this is one of those projects using the cricket. You can see right there is the cricket, so it doesn't weigh very much. And the woman who who designed this was really into crew, so you know you can see the connection. Um, that might be the only picture I have of a cricket project. Whoops, went all the way back to there. What does that do? I think it just rose around. I don't know. Lost track. Um, oh, it has a sound sensor. The, the pipe cleaners are holding up a sound sensor. So I guess when you clap, that's the motor right there. And you can see the gears that run the paddles. It looks like, yeah, this little red thing is a motor too, so it looks like it has some steering capability. But I don't know, um, I don't know how that, you know, what the control program was, why it would steer one way or another. There looks to be a sensor there. Maybe, I think maybe if it hits something, it would try to back up. Yeah, that's definitely a touch sensor. I have a feeling it didn't do all that when it was actually being showed off. I think it paddled around, and that was enough. Um, yeah. So I wanted, to, I wanted to actually, like, I, in the in the abstract, I wanted to actually like go into a little bit of the technology of the cricket itself. But I don't. I, we're sort of. At, in a, yeah. All right. Let me let me show you like. Okay. I'm going to show you like one of the first demos we built with the cricket, and partly why why do we call it cricket? Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Rick Borovoy, came up with the name. So he had this idea of, it wasn't just, it's not like you had to just have one cricket. If we, if we were to give these to people, we give you like three crickets at least. Because um, they have they have communication built into them. So every cricket can talk to other crickets. So we had this idea of like the insects sort of chirping in the fields and listening to each other and stuff. I don't know where I could put this where people can see it. Well, we'll see if it works on the floor. Can people see the floor right in front of me? All right. It's just a little quickie demo. Um, we have these two tiny robots that are, all they are is a cricket with two motors. But they can see each other. And they're, they're a dance team. So... <laughs> When they see each other, they get all excited, and then they go and do a dance. You guys want to bring that table? Maybe we can put it on the table. Oh, that is cool. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, oh, cha cha cha. It's a, it is. It is. It's a cha cha. It's the cha cha. That's excellent. We, Rick and I actually spent a lot of time, you know, on the particulars of the dance. It was kind of sad. <laughs> Um, the, the, that's the motor. It's a motor indicator. There is a, you probably can't see it, there's a, a yellow LED that's wired in series with the IR transmit, so you can easily, if, you can see what's transmitting. Yeah. Yeah, so if we put something opaque between them and... Hey, I can't believe I actually see through that. 
I think there's only two or three states in the program, so they'll you know keep going until they. <laughs> it's reflecting or something. Just I might. Got to dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got to dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, we can come and play with them afterward. Right. So let me actually show you. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't bring any peripherals, but I can I can do math on the cricket. <laughs> so here's a cricket. Here's the serial. We have our own serial um, to IR hardware. Um, here, I'll just put these up here. Um, okay. So we actually built the environment, the software environment for the crickets is built inside of this logo. So this is sort of proof to computer scientists how powerful logo is. We actually built a logo compiler inside of logo. So that's very much in keeping with the scheme and logo spirit. So if I type beep, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to compile beep. And then it's going to transmit that to the cricket, and then it's going to tell the cricket to run what it just sent it, and the cricket will beep. I don't know if you already hear it. Uh oh. Oh, I didn't hit return. Here we go. You'll hear it? Yeah. So I can say repeat three times, beep, and I'll have to put a wait one tenth of a second uh, so that they're separate beeps. Right? So we can say, you know. There's, not, there's nothing plugged in, so I can't really do very much. There, that's so six times. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can define procedures. It's not just. Sorry, what was that comment? Try pi times. Yeah, we could do some numerical like integer approximation for pi. <laughs> You know, I mean, you can do, did you guys do Fibonacci example? No. You can. All right, let's see. If n equals 1, return 1. And oh, the, the stack is really short, so see so, you. Yeah. The second one is also 1, right? Oh, it's not return. God, I've been programming too much in C. Yeah, ah, that's embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing if you're you're on work build with all that information. Uh, it, it just it just shows you what I've been programming in last oh, fib of that. I don't think we need parens really. Well, we might. Yes. By default. So actually, if you don't have parentheses, it doesn't do the right thing. Well, we have this really, we try to make the compiler as simple as possible, so there's no precedence. So let me, so what, I know the last the last one would work, because basically it would go through and say fib needs one input, and then that would work. Right, right. So I think it would. Uh, I think this is going to work. As well, this would, oh, this will yeah. definitely work, yeah. If you left the parentheses out, I think it would say, Negative oh yeah, it would just it line would line just it would fib. it would just bind those two together. Right, it would bind yeah. those two together, and then it would try to write. Yeah. All right, so let's download that program. Or it might do. Maybe so it, it took up 44 bytes to do that, and now we can say repeat fib four. What is what is the next one? Three is that five? Is that the answer? One one two three five. One one. one so that'll be three. Yeah, it worked. Well, most kids wouldn't write that program. <laughs> um, and, and actually, because the, the first cricket we made only had 256 bytes of code space, right? So this took up 44. So that would be, you know, like one eighth of the, less than that, one sixth of the code space. 
Um, but it wasn't actually a problem for kids because, you know, they're just writing a little bit of control. And it, that, that, that demo is actually built using the first round of Cricut. So it, it, it you know, we just barely fit to get that whole thing going in 256 right. bytes. I'm unhappy that five is the same number as the beeps. Okay, so <laughs> it, it should be eight then, right? Right. Oh. <laughs> I know what's happening. It's, it's, it's in, yeah. There's, um, when the stack overflows, it beeps five times. We can write a tail recursive. Yeah. Oh, can you, no, you can't do fib tail recursive. You can do that tail recursive. You have to just throw in four parameters or something. Uh-huh. It does do tail recursion, yeah. So, right. so who can do that? Is the dance program written in this? Yeah, yeah. So you, so you can do motion and you can. Oh yeah, so there's the there's commands here. I, I guess the way we'll do this is. Um, it has. Okay. <laughs> here, I, I'm not going to reprogram these because. Uh, I've lost the development environment that works in the first version. And also has a different IR, so it would be a real pain. Why would FIB 6 overload the system? Now that's a question you should be able to tell me. The stack depth is only about like four levels deep. And this is horribly exponential, right? This is yeah. terrible. Right? You all know this is terrible. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I could probably only do fib of, well, let's see, could you even do fib of three? So fib of three is two. So, but at least it's recursing a little there, rather than just giving you the answer. So let's see if we could do fib of three. No, I can't even do that. Wow. Wait, is this working at all? Are you going to try one? Yeah. Hmm. Well, that couldn't go wrong. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. just the stack is really short. Um, and because the, re the repeat expression also is using up stack to, to get, because the argument for the repeat has to get pushed on the stack. We're limited by the RAM that's that's in the PIC chip. It's the, the biggest resource limitation in this, in this system. Because um, the core execution loop is something like 300 logo instructions per second, which, you know, that's not... Super fast, but you know how fast do the robots move? Right, not very. Um, yeah, let me just show you how to. So I plugged the the two motors for that little model into the into the cricket, and so now to get the motors to move, there's just commands for the motors. So I can say motor A. Oops. Turn on for one tenth of a second. Yeah, it's going to go straight just because. Well, let's see. If motor B is wired backward, it might. So you turn them on rather than specify a distance? Right. It's timing based because it doesn't know how far it's gone. Right. Yeah, and that's, uh, that, that's actually one of the first things that, that kids deal with is they think that, that like, particularly if they've had the logo turtle background, but even if not, they think I want it to go this far. And then there's... They've built the model, so you know who knows what the gear ratio is, what size the wheels are. So the first things they have to discover is that you control it with time, and then you can make a correlation between time and distance. And then the next thing you discover is that one day, you know, five seconds will be the right amount of time, and the next day it's not. So the model doesn't do what you wanted it to because you know the battery level changes, or the the wheels slip differently, or it's not exactly positioned right. So um, there's a lot of sort of learning about real-world systems that, that kids do when they, when they go through these projects. Has anyone ever done a kind of, um, uh, a kind of placebo test, if you like, with kids who've been through this kind of environment as opposed to pe kids with very similar situations who haven't and what they go on to do and um, what their aptitudes are and so on? Yeah, those um, long-term... Studies, uh, I, I don't, I mean, there's nothing systematic that I'm aware of having to do with, with logo. And it's been, it's, it's, a, it's a valid criticism of our work in general that we make these arguments about why this is valuable for kids mm -hmm. and schools should have activities like this. And then someone will say, yeah, well, what, you know, you've been doing this for a while. 
where is that study? And we don't have it. Right. Um, and I think partly it's because that sort of study can't realistically be done because there's just so many factors in, in over the long term of, of a kid's, you know, growing up in their life and school. And I just don't think it's a, it's, it's not a reasonable way to look at, uh, you know, what the effects of something are. And I mean, I think the way I usually I would get, you know, criticized back by saying. The tests that do try to say what the effects of a, you know, a limited intervention are are also, those, those are flawed results in and of themselves, even when you're claiming certain results. And, you know, I think the MCAS, and that's part, it's part of a national movement of, towards increased testing. And, you know, I think it's a disaster in terms for, for learning. Um, Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System. Um, so we have more anecdotal stories. I mean, there's definitely kids that I work with personally who I know it made a big impact on their lives. And there's, I've worked, I worked with a group of kids at a vocational school. And, you know, vocational schools are for kids who aren't doing well at school. Um, and one, one kid in particular I worked with, it was two years that, that, I, that I was meeting with them once a week as part of this class that I was doing. And the second year, there's a big transformation in his whole attitude towards himself and school in general. Um, and he did some great work. Um, and so you can see those sort of things. And most of the teachers that I work with will have examples of particular kids in their class who, who aren't doing that well at school. You know, the conventional school activities don't appeal to them, and they just have a blossoming when this activity is brought into the environment. What's the age of the kid you work with? That kid was like 14, 15. It was high school. Yeah, but most of the work that I do now, and and I think where this stuff is most successful is at the elementary school level, like anywhere from first grade through fifth grade. And it's not so much based on the age of the kids as it is more on the nature of the educational environment. That in in primary school, um, you've got one teacher and, and one class of kids, and and time is much more fluid. Um, you can set up you know activities longer than 45 minutes. Um, and then the, the Lego building activities become situated in the larger context of learning. It's not just about making a robot. Um, but I'm doing this project in Ireland with the commercial Mindstorms. Um, and there we're, we're doing storytelling and narrative where kids are building models that uh, explore some history. It could be local history or um, you know, world history. And they're making sort of animated dioramas that tell a story. Um, so, and, and that really, you know, that sort of way of working, you just can't do it in high school now, you know. It's the curriculum's chopped up and the science teacher doesn't talk to the history teacher and there you are. Um, let me just mention how you do sensors in, in this environment. One way you could do it here, we'll get rid of the fib probe. I don't have a sensor. Oh, I know what I could do. It's just the second one of these, or the, you need them both? The second both? one is just neater than the first. They're both probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you just have three parameters, and the first one counts down to zero, and then when it gets to zero, it outputs the first parameter. Uh huh. So, I think that'll work. Fine. All right. That's a class one. Okay. I'll have to leave you a cricket then. <laughs> Equals zero. Okay. Yes. Look inside the value of the variable. Colon is short for a function called thing which takes the name of the variable, thing, quote, and, and says the value of what's inside. What's the equivalent for that? In? There is no equivalent for that. In, in, in scheme, everything's evaluated. Here you have to say, evaluate this specifically as a variable. Is that the logo thing, or that's the... It's a logo thing. It's, it's a logo thing. Yeah, it's logo. Oh. Okay, so if n is zero, you're going to give the result, which is in the first. Right, so you need to call this like fib five one one. You have to initialize the first and second to one one. Okay. And then they start. So five one one will be the same as four uh, one two, which would be the same as 
three. Right. So you count down, you give the answer, and and the the second parameter. Um. Yeah. Might as well. Yeah, I, I oh, actually, no, that should work. You get away with it because it looks at the arithmetic operators and does an infix. It looks left and right rather than. It, it's a little. It's more user friendly where the user is a kid than the scheme. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I think if you didn't do it, it might work any. Hey, it's shorter 31 bytes. Okay. Well. All right, we're due fib of one. Yeah, you have to do fib of one. Oh, oh. Uh, fib of five. Hey, look, you trapped the error. Okay, so we want to do one, one, one would work then, right? Uh, that should just be one. Uh, let's go all the way up to five. That's our non-test. Well, that was, yeah, but we don't really know. So six should be eight. Oh, it still blew the stack. I think it's like four calls, though. Oh, you know what it is? The arguments also pile up. So we, I think we don't even get much of anything. Let's, let's try like two. Hey, that worked. Let's try three. Three should be three. Oh, all right. And then four should be five. Oh, but, but, that made me but we don't know. But, but yeah. Like the feature quicker when, when oh, yeah? The stack. Oh, that could be. Oh, here. Right, right, right. Here we go. So put an 18. Let's see how quick it is. All right. So our three is three. And four. Is four is five. Yeah. Good one. Good ear. <laughs> That's nice. Wow. So this question. Okay. So I wonder if the interpreter knows this is tail recursive. Because if it's tail recursive, it shouldn't be generating a stack, right? It's just. Oh, it's just calling itself. It's just calling itself, right? You're not doing anything. You're right. Yeah, it should just be a go to. Hmm. And it's not part of the if. It's not like it thinks it's in the house. Right. Oh, oh, wait, no, we don't, oh. No, because we, we're outputting. We have to not do an output. So, that's it, that's it. Oh, fib, oh, uh, uh, it, um. This will be fine. This will be okay. No, it's because it, it, um, the fib outputs something. What was it? Yeah, but the output now is down in the base case. So, so as long as it sees that the recursive call is the last thing in the program, it should know it's tail recursive. Yeah, the, the language doesn't let you make a, um, a procedure which sometimes outputs and, and you see, basically, yeah. uh, it, 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 if fib is going to generate an output in that, in that call, and so you have to do something with it, we could throw it away. But then how... You have to do something? Oh, because it's going to say it has an output. I don't know what to do with the output. Right. No, I think in Intel recursion... Try this, because I... I yeah, no, it, 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 it already did that. What is that? You don't say what to do with fib and fib. Oh, it doesn't like it any, any Yeah. Anymore. You can say ignore, but then it's not going to know it's tail recursive, so what's the point of that? Yeah, I guess it doesn't. I guess it doesn't do the. I mean, I know it'll do tail recursion if you're just counting down and you're not re returning right. anything. Yeah. We could have it stored in a global and then, you know. All right. Well, we, we could have a third you're variable. You're in the middle of something before you have applied the fib to the third variable just to throw it away. And then how are we going to get it back out in the final time? Well, we could have. Uh, I don't think there's a good solution. Because it's yeah, it's it's not really doing a, it's it's not doing all cases of tail recursion. If, if you type yeah, if you type output, it should also know it's tail recursion, but it doesn't. Right, I think that's all it is. Yeah. That the right answer is for it to output it, but um, yeah, it's not getting it. Okay. Oh well. Anyway. Well, I was going to show sensors, um, but I'll, I'll just describe it because I don't actually have a sensor to plug in. I mean, I could simulate a sensor by sending an IR pulse, mm -hmm. but basically, there's you, you build an infinite loop. And then you just test the sensor value. You say, if the sensor is this, do that. If the sensor is something else, 
do the other thing. Um, and then we also have, so that's sort of a polling based model. We also have an event driven model where you can say like when, you can set up a daemon basically. You can say when this condition becomes true, take this action. Um, and, and that's sort of a nice way to think about sensors that like typically you're building, particularly in the creature case, you want it to respond when the touch sensors hit. So you don't want to have to think about, oh, I'm making a loop and I'm always testing to see if that touch sensors hit. So the software gives you the capability to say, you know, when the touch sensors hit, take this action. Um, because of the resource limitations on the cricket, we can only have one of those demons, um, which is limiting. For the software like this that we've done for the, the RCX brick and our earlier red brick, uh, we could have eight demons. Um, and that approach of thinking about the sensors as, as being sort of always active and triggering when conditions are met, we built that, we sort of made a, a design that LEGO implemented in the commercial software that, that ships with their, with their brick. So there's, um, it's an iconic sort of environment where you're dragging blocks and snapping them together to, de and there's text inside of each block. So it's, vaguely logo like in that there's sort of it, there's commands and and you know and arguments um, it's not really logo underneath this you couldn't do this program in, in the environment lego built um, but it, it's very easy to use it's great for kids who've never programmed before it like frustrates the bejesus out of anybody who has programmed before because <laughs> they want to do something like this um, but it's easy to use, and you know, it gets, and and the demon model is really the right thing, I think, for most of what kids want to do. You want to be able to say, when this touch sensor is hit, do this set of stuff. When that other touch sensor is hit, do this. When the light sensor changes, do this other thing. Um, Their lives are event driven. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll just I'll just close by pointing out um, this work that we did on the crickets. We just wrote a paper um, that I, I can't see the scroll bar. It's off the screen. Okay. Here. Um, that was printed in the IBM System Journal. They did a double issue that's all uh, Media Lab work, so we, we got a paper into that. Um, we can't put this terrible name, MetaCricket. But a lot of what people have been doing with crickets in, within the media lab is there's been a lot of people, uh, other researchers at the lab who've been using them to prototype their own systems, their own sort of you know, computational physical systems. Because um, you saw how easy it was, right? You know, we wrote tail recursive programs that didn't work and turned motors on and off and you know, no time at all. And there aren't many things like that out there. Um, so there's... Um, I'm just going to scroll through this and show some of the projects that that people have done. Um, so we, you know, we, I explain about the virtual machine inside the cricket and you know how the software works. Um, one and uh, here's where I wanted to come to the one of the big one of the big innovations that we, that sort of happened by accident. Oh come on, what's it doing? Oh, now that now the network isn't working. No, but we got to here. Yeah, but this this is how our network works, <laughs> <laughs> or lack thereof. It, it'll eventually probably. Find okay. It. Well, what what we built. There, there we go. Oh, well, it's lots bigger. Um, what that shows is in the sort of center, a little bit to the left, is a cricket, and then there's a bunch of stuff plugged into it. So at the beginning, I said the Cricket only has two motors and two sensors, which is sort of true. It has built-in drivers for two and two. But it has um, a peripheral interconnect system that lets the one Cricket talk to like a dozen or so other things. Um, and we came up with this idea of basically packaging the intelligence, sort of the, the software drivers that, uh, that go with the other thing with the other thing itself. So. Like this is um, a three-digit LED display, and on the back of that board is another one of the PIC chips, the same processor that runs the Cricut, that's got drivers so that knows how to run the, the, the LED display. So then the Cricut just has to send a tiny message saying, hey, throw this number up, and it works. Um, we also run power over the line, so it's really just one wire plugged in. You could have all these accessories. So this is a sound sensor. Um, this is a... 
and this, is, this one here is a, a MIDI synthesizer. It's shaped like a boat. And that one was sort of a breakthrough in, in, in our work because we didn't design it. And the people who did design it was another group at the lab, and they built it for a particular purpose. But they happened to put a PIC chip on the thing, and they were just controlling it over a serial line. And when their, their project was done, they had a bunch of these boards left over, so we were like, hey, we can plug that into our Cricut. And we just programmed the PIC chip on that board to talk our protocol, and suddenly there was a MIDI synthesizer that was part of the Cricut system. Um, and that one really led to this whole, there were a bunch of music projects that, that people ended up building with Cricut. So I think I've got... How long has the Cricut been around? The first ones were like four years ago, but I think they've really taken off in the last two years. This one is um, a, a, a Play-Doh music synthesizer. So it's like dead simple. The Play-Doh, has, it turns out, is like got a lot of salt in it. So it, it's a great conductor. So basically, I mean, in the electrical sense, but in the musical sense as well. <laughs> so we just have these two copper electrodes. They plug into the resistive port in the sensor, uh, the resistive sensor port that's already there in the cricket. And then, you know, you just write a one-liner that translates the resistive reading into some music command. You could do, you know, whatever you want. You sort of switch the play around? Yeah, and, you know, it changes the resistance and it makes all these fun sounds. <laughs> So that one was just like kind of a, you know, a simple demo. But then uh, some other people in the lab built some like more serious music toys. Um, people in uh, Todd Macover's group, who's um, one of the professors that that does computer music at the lab. He's, he's the professor. Who's, that's his his area. Um, so one of his students named Gilly Weinberg built this thing. He calls it the Squeeze Man, um, and that, he took like miniature koosh balls and embedded some kind of pressure sensor in, into them. And then those just run to the cricket sensor input. And, and basically it's just, you know, here's sort of the block diagram. There's two of those squeeze sensors running straight into the cricket. And then that, that MIDI boat music synthesizer. But he's like both a serious mathematician and a computer scientist. A uh, serious musician, sorry, and a computer scientist. So he had a very complicated mapping more so than the one-liner I was just describing with the Play-Doh um, that I didn't really understand. But, but so he was exploring some, you know, some kind of far-out ideas in mapping, and, and he was able to prototype the thing with basically this off-the-shelf, you know, within the context of the Media Lab hardware, which for him was very liberating because he's not a hardware guy. Um, so he was able to build this demo, you know, that, to explore the music ideas in, in really quick fashion. Um, he ended up doing another project with our stuff that, God, this stupid browser loses state when you go back. Would you see this as a sort of parallel to the sort of basic standard? Yep, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's the closest thing that exists uh, in, the, in the commercial world is, is, is the basic stamp. Um, the basic stamp is uh, a little uh, board that includes the pick with the virtual machine, so uh, a lot like the Cricut, um, and it has a compiler that sits on your Windows box that uh, is, uses the basic programming language and compiles into bytecodes that then you can stick on uh, this little board. So at the top level, it's really very much the same as the Cricut. Um, the, the big differences are is that we include some stuff on the Cricut itself that they don't, like the motor drivers, the sensor drivers, and the IR communications. So you sort of get a lot right out of the box with the Cricut, whereas with the basic stamp, you have to build those circuits, which is fine if you're an EE person, but if you're not, that's going to be a barrier. Um, I'd say that's, that's the biggest difference. We have a different idea of how to of how you connect other peripherals. And we have like a nice collection like this MIDI synthesizer and a bunch of things, whereas the basic stamp, there are, there are some of those things. So I shouldn't say that's a profound difference. Um, we also have the command line where they don't have the command line. So it has a much more interactive scheme or logo-like flavor than theirs is just compile, download, and see what happens. Um, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not that different. Um, so I'd say, until one of, the, one of the things I'm hoping to do now I left the Media Lab is get crickets out into the world. So we're trying to get MIT to release the technology. Um, and basically, we're 
it basically boils down to a conversation with the Lego company and making sure that they don't feel threatened if the cricket got into the world. Because um, I mean, I don't think it sh it shouldn't be a hard shouldn't be a hard decision for them to make because it's not the same market. People who want the RCX brick aren't going to buy crickets. And so buy the cricket is not currently sold publicly. Correct. Okay. And we haven't even released the full specs of the design. You, you couldn't go to the website and download enough information to build one. Mm. Could not. Um, but we're hoping to solve that over the next couple of months. I actually have a meeting later today to work on that. Um, and the worst case is um, I'll be able to license the stuff directly from MIT regardless of what Lego thinks. But I don't want to, you know, it's more important that I don't get into an adversarial relationship with Lego then. Lego's powerful. Well, they are actually. No, but you know, I, I, you know, I know a lot of people inside the company, and I've done consulting work for them, and so. Just don't call them crickets. Call them CRKTs. <laughs> <laughs> and that would really get to them. RCX is just rearrange the letters. It's almost the same ones in cricket. I never noticed that. That's really that's like almost true. Maybe we should stop here. Yeah. Do we have questions? Sarah. Do you think these will always be on such a small scale, or do you hope to build them to something perhaps more, more durable? Actually, um, I, w I was telling Shai at the, the beginning, we were just talking to each other. I'm joining a startup um, for the next few months that's building something very cricket like, um, except that it's IP enabled. Um, so we're making something that's the sort of at the scale of the cricket that you can plug into a TCRP network and, and talk to it using standard internet protocols. So I mean, this is a startup, so we're hoping that that product will sell in the millions, um, <laughs> you know, units, right? Hopefully yeah. dollars as well. <laughs> but I am actually a prototype of that. My <laughs> 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 friend who sent me the right control. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's sort of the direction of what you're asking, though. Um, what? More I was asking, because I know, was it Pentium that just recently came out with a chip that's maybe three inches by three inches? It's got all the power of a regular computer. Mm. Uh, I mean, it takes five volts mm -hmm. to power it, but it's got up to 64 megs. Mm -hmm. It's something that's, I, mean, I didn't really look at your yeah well a lot of people when uh, like com computer science people when they actually read the specs of the cricket and I was saying you know saying this that it, the core instruction loop is like 300 instructions per second which is ridiculously slow I mean you know a pentium is 300 million or something right mm -hmm. yeah it's 300 megahertz um, so they're not like they're not at the same scale at all in terms of computational power. So a lot of it is, you know, I was, I was saying that uh, you know uh, James Watt didn't feel himself as an inventor because he was just putting ideas together. A lot of that you could say is true of the cricket. It, there's not anything fundamentally new there. It's just a novel combination of stuff that that's been around that sort of lets you do things that that the, a, a novice can do things that beforehand would require a lot of specialized expertise. Um, and that sort of, that was the driving philosophy of Logo 30 years ago. And I think is still true of, of these technologies. And if you look at the, the Lego yellow brick, which got passed around, um, there's a whole bunch of people that got turned on to robotics that never tried it before. Um, the first year, like two thirds of their market was like people like ourselves in this room, you know, adults who wanted to play with robots and never, never could until now. Um, so I, th I think that's the enabling power of technology to sort of, you know, let people have access to ideas that previously seemed too complicated, too esoteric, and it really isn't that way. It's just you know, packaging it so you can get your hands on it. So I know that doesn't answer your question, but. <laughs> well, I mean, part of the idea is that it's stripped down because the purposes you use it for don't need. Any, yeah. Um, right, you don't need a Pentium. Right, I mean, we're not forecasting the weather with these things. We're right. Right. We're going to find outlets on a wall or something. Right. Yeah, John? I didn't catch exactly what the, um, the musical play there did. Did it kind of like shape, reshape, and dance to a musical input? You squeeze the Play-Doh, and um, depending on the code that, that reads the... So the Play-Doh just returns one, one parameter. It's a resistance reading. 
Um, and so that can get mapped into different ways. My favorite demo is one that maps it into the percussion track on, on a MIDI synthesizer. So basically, actually the program that I put into it when I would show it off is every tenth of a second it, it reads the Play-Doh value and generates a percussion noise. Right, so it's an instrument. Yeah, right. I was thinking of it more as, you know, it'd be great if you could put some musical input in and see how it reacts to Beethoven. Oh, you're thinking the other way around. <laughs> So the Play-Doh gets animated somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Play-Doh yeah, Play okay. gets animated, you plug it into the stereo and you see how it reacts. <laughs> <laughs> That's a project. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm curious whether you've looked at possibly, uh, it's got the infrared sensors, but what about yeah. possibly uh, radio frequencies so yeah. that you could connect the crickets to a, uh, a computer right. somewhere, and you could, since they don't have as much processing, you could have them just send information about where they are and what they're doing in the computer. Right. You, could, you know, organize a squadron of crickets right. to you know, fly around or walk around. Right. Yeah, we, we actually have played with radio. Um, we have, with our, our bus system, we have a radio transmitter, radio receiver, so you can, you know, if you had the full set of peripherals, you could easily start prototyping that stuff. Um, the particular idea you mentioned of like robots reporting where they are, the where they are problem is 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 actually hard because they don't know where they are. Um, you know, a lot of ro robotics research is robots that can look around them with various sensors and try to figure out where they are um, by having a map or constructing a map. So that's just a hard problem. Um, and you can solve that by having beacons and different systems for things to know. But GPS in every room. <laughs> well, that would work for macro, you know, where they are outside, but it doesn't work for where they are inside. Well, you really. could do the same type, same right. idea with some sort right. of, you know. I'd, I'd say at the point where you've got all that stuff working, then you'll want something more powerful in the cricket because you've only got 2K of code space. <laughs> yeah. But... But yeah, radios, you know, doing different radio things is also, it's definitely fun. And I mean, for, for example, to figure out where they are, you could have just to have them on a grid yep. with a light sensor that, you know, the grid could be some sort of three dim oh, two-dimensional barcode that yeah, could, you could read do that. The, the light patterns on that or some sort of Braille thing or whatever right. in light dots. Right, yeah, you did the augmented environment. You can also put a camera on the ceiling looking down and have them carry, you know, marker, have them carry the barcodes. Yeah. Like what at the MIT Museum, they've got a mm. game that you can play, uh, drop the ball into a hole and it reads where you are. It's a little labyrinth game. Oh, oh, yeah. It works with two knobs. Yeah, okay. Like Actually, I know one of the people who worked on that. Yeah, I've, I've heard it described, but I've never seen it. I didn't realize it was set up. I should go there. Yeah, it's got so it looks at your body, how you're moving your body, and then that controls the virtual... It, it's where you're standing on the board. It's uh -huh. like a tilt board. You okay. Stand on it and it moves your center of gravity. But, but the, it's, it's a camera that reads where you are yeah. and plugs that into the computer that makes it look like the thing that you're yeah. standing on tilts. Right, right. No weight sensors or anything. Right. Like that, just right, right. relative position. Yes. Is it military doing research on things like this? Um, I, I wouldn't really know. I mean, I'm sure they're doing stuff with, you know, large numbers of cooperating autonomous robots. You know, I, I'm sure they're doing that stuff. And, uh. <laughs>